Oh, I love the opening. <laughs> I'm just saying, they can hear you, that's all. And they can hear me now. <laughs> Hello, my friends. Welcome back. It is episode 52 of Rev's Palaver. And uh, it's appropriate that it's the Monday, November 13th, which is spooky, right, 13? Because <laughs> I'm joined today by Night Strider, better known as Assistant James on Lady Ravenwood's channel. And we're going to be talking Stranger Things, AKA Stranger Things season two, but I think they're just calling it Stranger Things two. They're not. They're leaving out the season. They're just Stranger Things two. James, how you doing tonight, mm -hmm. buddy? Excellent. Great, great. Excellent. I know you. Have, you actually you approached me. I think <laughs> the Monday after Stranger. You know, Rev, Rev, did you see Stranger Things? <laughs> I want to talk to you about it. Right. Because I'm the only one in this household that actually watched it. <laughs> I got her watching like season. I got her watching the first episode now. So, I mean, we're just in baby steps. But I had no one to talk to about it. And then as soon as you said Stranger Things, I was like, oh, I gotta talk to someone. <laughs> uh, wait, real quick, real quick. And I'm sorry for the shameless self promotion. But did you see the new merchandise we put up in the Proper Nerd store? Yes, I did. How sweet I is like that? It. That is very sweet. Well, for those who I don't like know, we've got the Proper Nerds black hoodie with the sort of Stranger Thingsy font. We've already sold two mm -hmm. of them. That's awesome. Yeah, people want them, I guess. I like so, there you go. Thank you very much to Rock and Rage for the host. Very happy that you're here. So, just a quick uh, heads up to anyone who is joining from Rock and Rage Stream. We are talking Stranger Things today. This will be a spoiler zone. We're going to be interacting with chat. If anyone wants to jump in on chat, we'll, yeah. we'll be doing it. But uh, before we get into it, James, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself, a little bit about the Lady Ravenwood channel, etc. Well, um, about over the summertime, I can't remember exactly when I thought, all right, I have all this. I, I, I work in the movie business. I do like short films and independent films. And I was like, and I like video games. So I thought maybe I could mash them together and, and do a streaming show and I tried doing it myself at first and it was a colossal failure <laughs> so I was like she likes video games so I was like well it would be easier if I could just operate stuff behind the scenes and let her run this be the channel and it worked out and then we've been doing it ever since and I I'm, I'm usually sitting to the side playing games with her and we do a lot of tabletop that's how we started that's right and, and, and hello is that James is often the disembodied voice you hear as Lady Ravenwood is doing this. Hold on. This is my Lady Ravenwood impression. Huh? No, it's... No, I, I got that treasure chest. No, I no, I got that one. That's my Lady Ravenwood impression. <laughs> she turns, yeah, talks to you, and then <laughs> turns back. We are gonna we, we, we we're gonna we got it we got the room set up now so we're gonna actually uh, once we got a decent enough table because the table's like really tiny um, which is gonna happen this week we're gonna get back to tabletop games because we're gonna have people over uh, we got some friends that this all of a sudden out of nowhere was like hey let's pull, I want to play some tabletop games like <laughs> so there's, there's Greg or I guess people call him JB but I like Greg. Yeah, I call right. him Old Greg. Or B, B Bivens. Bivens. Yeah, but I he I call him Greg. That's my name for him. <laughs> he uh, doesn't mind. <laughs> and uh, anyone else Ble is Bleach rejoining you? Uh, Bleach has actually moved to Florida, mm. unfortunately. Mm. Uh, he he got he ended up getting a really good job down there, and, and we love him to death. And he said he'll come back eventually, and when he does, well. Uh, we always have a seat at the table for him, so. <laughs> great. Well, I, you know, he's a real nice guy, so I'm glad that yeah. he's doing well. That's uh, that's that's great. So, uh, why don't you just stand up real quick and show everyone your awesome outfit? <sighs> I'm just wearing my Ghostbuster shirt. <laughs> yes. 
Bankman in, in honor of Stranger Things 2 <laughs> when they dress up as Ghostbusters. You can't be Bankman. I'm Bankman. I'm Bankman. We specifically agreed on this. We're supposed to be Winston. What? I gotta be Winston because I'm... What? Why do I have to be Winston? <laughs> because I'm black? Is that what it is? <laughs> we were all thinking that, but no one was saying it. it no was one great. was saying it. <laughs> <laughs> hello, I'm just going to say a quick uh, hello to Retro Ogre, who was Team MZ Streamer of the Week uh, last week, and we had an awesome podcast Woo! with on Friday. Thank you for stopping by. This is my personal podcast, Reds Palaver. This is episode 52. So, um, I usually put them up on, I archive them up on YouTube, like whenever I get around to it, sort of. I'm, I'm real bad about doing it on a schedule. I figure <laughs> if I get the... The, the podcast up on Twitch on time, then mm -hmm. like they can be archived whenever, really, right? Well, it would have been it would have been appropriate if this was the 11th podcast, but you know, <laughs> you know, I I, I I hate to say the 11th podcast is about oh nine or ten or 11 months well past, so <laughs> we're way past the 11th one. Um, I know, <laughs> you know, but let's let's get into it. Stranger Things. As a, let's start with Stranger Things as a series. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I love the most about it, and probably the thing that hooked me right away, first and foremost, was the visual aesthetic. How they yes. went to such great lengths to really put it in that 80s motif. But that's not all the show is. No, it's not. It's not, it's not like... <sighs> There's a lot of shows, a lot of movies, shows that will will do that. Will 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 um, the show will be about like that '70s show. There's a perfect example. It was just about the the style and everything of the '70s. But it, they, they, it's just it's background. But the background is so flawless. You feel like you're in the '80s. And as an '80s kid, I remember <laughs> a lot of that stuff. And I think that that's what a lot of people like too is that nostalgia of bringing you back to like. I remember those those are I the, the best the, the thing I, I love the best the first thing I did when, it, when she had the rotary phone mm -hmm. I was like I remember having <laughs> so kids any of you kids that are watching who don't understand what a rotary phone is we oh, used to actually have to take our fingers and <laughs> put them in a dial and then turn the dial with our finger and what would happen is this crank would actually inside the phone make like electric sparks that would dial the number that would send signals it, it was a it was the olden days We're, i mean you know we had just defeated the last dinosaur yes and, and we had invented rotary telephones shortly after you know disco has gone away rock and roll has come into place <laughs> um yeah it's funny you mentioned that 70s show though because i think that 70s show ran for i think nine years like it ran uh, for nine seasons, eight seasons, eight seasons. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I don't remember. I just sort of remember, but it was kind of funny because the very first season was 1974. So people yeah. were like, um, <laughs> like <laughs> how is it still the 70s? But they, the the very last episode of that 70s show, it was New Year's Eve 1979 mm -hmm. into 1980. Yeah. So they, they kind of really fudged it. But but relating that to Stranger Things, one of the reasons why that '70s show worked is because the characters were so interesting. The characters were so mm -hmm. complex, and you know, there was some real depth to the characters. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. and, and and that's what I like about Stranger Things too. I mean, granted, we haven't really seen that much depth of. Um, Dustin and and uh, but with well really no you have kind of seen Dustin's home life it's the other kid and then forgive me I, I'm drawing a blank with his name <laughs> I'm not Winston <laughs> um oh oh uh yeah <laughs> oh god no I'm sorry I just had to deal with one thing in chat real quick so I I, I got distracted I apologize it was, what, what Mikey, did you say it the black kid the black kid Mikey Dustin the black kid <laughs> and Will. And I mean, just the, the, but their backstories—you kind of know a little bit about their backstories. Lucas, I mean, Lucas, it, 
Lucas, thank you. And um, um, it's just it, it's 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 great. I love I love I love. I love the um, I love the style of the of the way, even the way it's filmed is like, nineteen eighties, to an extent. Yeah, and it just brings out that feel, and you feel like you're there, and you feel like you're you're with them, trying to find their friend, trying to in the season one, when when Will went missing, you kind of felt like you were there, looking for him right along, and and and, and, and to bring you into that kind of world. And to make you feel like you're there, and, and with with everything that's going on, is great. Is great. <laughs> well, so the funny thing is, so Stranger Things one started mm-hmm. out, I believe it's 1983, right? Yes. And yep. I often tell people the reason I have a D20 as my avatar is I started playing Dungeons and Dragons in 1984. So when the show first opened, they started with. One of the very first things you see is that wooden key hook that has the keys hanging on it. Mm -hmm. And I remember that in so many people's houses when I was a little kid. Like, I remember that exact, just that little prop immediately hooked me in. Yeah. And it was weird that that was one of the very first things you see in the show. And then they're playing D&D in the basement. I'm like, oh my God, this is me. This is my life. These kids are like... (laughs) I've been there. Yeah. <laughs> and in and, and, and the, and the wood paneling. Yes. <laughs> in Will Byers house, the wood paneling is like, I'm like, oh God. And even in the basement, because of, of Mikey's house, the wood paneling, it's just like, and the real, in the walkie talkies they use. I remember having those. <laughs> yes. And we thought they were the coolest thing because your friend could be like, like you know, a couple blocks over, and we're we're sitting there in our bedrooms, just like talking to each other, like we're <laughs> like it's high tech. <laughs> now I have to admit, in my case, it was the plastic, the green plastic GI Joe walkie talkies that my <laughs> friend had. It wasn't those silver metal ones. It was, mm. you know, and and the range on them was not very good. I mean, there was my house, then one neighbor's house, then my friend's house, and then another friend's house. So, like, four houses in a row, I could talk to my friend four houses down with the Mm walkie-talkie. But, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, so the theme, I I want to, we've got so much to talk about, I I don't want to get just stuck on one thing. So the theme was fantastic, but more to the point, Stranger Things really captures its viewers with, with the characters. Yes. And... At this point, everyone, we shouldn't have to go over too much in Stranger Things 1. You know, I we want to get into the meat of Stranger Things 2. Yes. But Stranger Things 1 hooked us. It was it was a lot of ways this origin story of the kids and Eleven and so on and so forth. And then Stranger Things 2 starts. And the first thing we see is a new character right off the bat. They don't, they don't ease us in by showing us, you know... Oh, yeah. here are the characters you know. It's all of a sudden, here's somebody, like, robbing a house, and now they're running from the cops, and then, you know, eight goes, Ugh, like this, and a bridge fall. Like, how yeah. did you feel about that as a way to reintroduce fans who have been waiting for, for season two? It threw me off at first. I thought they were going to go the direction of, like, X-Files. Like, all right, now we're going to see someone else's story or you know what I mean we're gonna see eight story and I kind of for the first five minutes I was kind of like pissed (laughs) I was like I was like no 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 get back to the people I want to see and then and then when it went back and we were we were back in and and you see Hopper and all the all in the kids and, and and Will and they're you know everything and I was like, okay, so now, so what did that have to do with anything? And they, you know, of course you could cheat and look ahead like I kind of did. But <laughs> if you didn't, you know, you're like, well, what did that have to do with anything? When are, they, when are we going to see that girl again? And, I, and it, made, it hooked you even more. It's like, so this is a lot bigger than this small little town. Mm-hmm. And I like that. One of the things that I found interesting was, so... Eleven, when she's using her telekinetic powers, her mm-hmm. entire move is just lean her head forward, furrow her brows, and sort of stare, right? Mm-hmm. 
And 8's power, uh, which is different than 11's, it's illusion or what have you. I don't know if you noticed this, but she was doing this. Like, she was kind of making a fist and, like, closing it and bringing it yeah. in. And I don't know what the rationale behind that was, but I didn't notice on my first watch, when she does that in the first scene, the first time you see it, you see the tattoo on her arm. You see the 008. So, but then, then of course, that, that makes you question, where's... One through when the words one through seven and nine and ten. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a feeling we're gonna see more of these kiddos in the in the in the future. I I hope so. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't I don't So I think eight was very critical to the development of eleven. She was the person who brought eleven back from that brink. We see this development between 11 and Hopper where there's this tumultuous like preteen rebellion right yeah she was the Vader to her Luke kind of yeah and and <laughs> so she runs away she runs away from mm -hmm. home she doesn't know that Hops is trapped in the tunnels she's just like fuck this I'm out of here but and she runs I mean, away speaking of that episode that particular episode did that not remind you of Empire Strikes Back. Well, not she's like not my friends are in trouble. But... I have to go, and she's like, "No, you, if you go, you're gonna get hurt." Okay, <laughs> you know, it's like Yoda said that to Luke. Wait yeah. a minute. <laughs> so Lassane says she wasn't crazy about. I'm gonna call it the bottle episode. The bottle episode with Eleven, where she goes off to to meet her sister Eight. Mm -hmm. um, I call it the bottle episode because really it was just her the whole time. It yeah. wasn't any of the other cast. Um, I think, what's her name? Millie Bobby Brown, the actress who plays Eleven. Mm -hmm. Had to have felt very challenged when she was filming it because there were so many scenes where it's her just sitting on a couch or staring at the TV and blinking or just eating Eggos or just her interacting with Hop. You know, that until that part, there is not a lot of interaction for her character and that that bottle episode is where 11 breaks out and rejoins the narrative in a way yes but did you did you ever read because i read up on this did you ever read why uh how she got the role no please tell me um from what i read and from what i understood of it and if anyone out there correct me if i'm wrong but from what i read is they that they told her she was too old she was not good at this she will never be an actress let it go before she went in for auditions so she was really upset and really like brooding and stuff and when she went in for the audition she was quiet and like she was 11 and then she got the job <laughs> but my understanding was this was her second job she had already done something for stephen king like a stephen king show yeah so i don't know maybe i i'm i'm not sure i mean that's that's what i heard um i'd have to look at like i didn't i have i've done a bit of a little bit of research and backstory but not a lot but when she was cast for this, and obviously I think we can say that the entire Stranger Things show is mm -hmm. very heavily patterned after Stephen King and Stephen King novels, 80s movies. I get of, a more Call of Cthulhu feel to it. I mean, to se me season two, but not season one. Even the, even the, all right. You played Elder Tor. Yep. All right. Portals open, creatures come through, madness starts taking over the world, and it's up to a handful of people to save the world. But and then season two, we're introduced to the Shadow Monster, which is straight out of Cthulhu. <laughs> but the thing is, is I think I feel like Stranger Things, the original, the first series was very, very obviously patterned after Stephen King. Like, even the font they use, the Stranger Things font, oh, it's yeah. very heavily patterned after Stephen King's Salem's titles lot? on the books. What's that? Was it Salem's Lot? Um, it, to me, it reminded me of Firestarter. I don't remember. Uh, but it looks like a Stephen King book title. I agree. I will agree with that. That, I, I you know... 
hundred percent. And that being said, Stephen King, a lot of his stories are heavily pe- patterned after Lovecraftian horror. So I think oh, yeah. that there's a definite chain of events mm. that, that leads back to Lovecraft. But I don't think that the series as a whole is directly Lovecraftian necessarily. I think I think it's, it's definitely I, more it, takes its draw from King. My, that's my think, opinion, though. I think part of me is just wishful thinking because I've been dying for something very Cthulhu to be coming out, and and nothing's ever hit the target for me until I saw Stranger Things. <laughs> well, and who knows? That I've heard that they want to do a total of five seasons or five episodes or whatever you want to call it well we're yeah well that'd be about right because we're up to 1985 so yeah and well that's assuming they keep they stay with one year in between they might yeah. they might skip they might do time skips i mean who knows although i don't <laughs> think they're going to for season three primarily because um at the end there's that comment they should stay quiet like they should stay hidden for at least a year Mm-hmm. So I'm like, oh, one year, like, oh, mm-hmm. all right. <laughs> but at the same time, I, 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 speaking of season three, as we fast forward a little bit, I, I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, I, I don't see where this is going to go. And I think that's why I'm more intrigued than a cliffhanger would have been. Mm-hmm. Like, like if there was a cliffhanger, I think it would have been like, all right, we know what's, I mean, we know what's going to happen. Kind of know what's going to happen next. And like, like when when Picard became Locutus, and they ended it that 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 one season of, of Star Trek, and then you all we all knew he was going to come back. He's one of the main characters, but when they leave it open ended like this, but without a cliffhanger, it leaves more to the it makes you think more. It makes you like, all right, well, what are they going to do next? Well, maybe it, it, it makes you it generates hype. I think in a good way, though. I mean, I'm not saying it's bad, but right, you know, it makes you think more about. What could possibly they do next? Well, maybe we're going to see 1 through 7. Maybe we'll see 9 and 10. Maybe, maybe because they shut down the research facility, maybe the porthole didn't get closed. Maybe it's, like, growing in there. You don't, we don't know. <laughs> Sammy, Sammy definitely agrees with you. She goes, she got the Lovecraft vibe, especially the vegetables dying and rotting on the ground. Because there's a whole Lovecraftian story that revolves around an alien meteorite landing and poisoning a whole farm, and then people go insane. And Retro Ogre says that was a long summer, the year the Picard became Locutus. Yes, it was. <laughs> I was like, I, I, that was the longest summer of my life. <laughs> and for a teenager, that's saying something. <laughs> that was in high school, I think, when that happened. Yeah. I was like, oh, come on. Is it, is it is it fall yet? I don't care if I gotta go back to school. <laughs> I mean, I, I... 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 Look, I'm not denying the Lovecraftian influence, the Lovecraftian inspiration. I'm just saying that I think that the series as a whole started out much more inspired by King than Lovecraft. That's all I'm... That's all I meant to say. You know what I mean? No, no. I'm not, I'm not denying the, the Lovecraft inspiration. and Now, that being said, okay, so going back to the the cliffhanger thing, I think that the cliffhanger is a lot more subtle, but it's definitely still there. So at the end of season one, Eleven is gone. We don't know where Eleven is. Will is seeing visions, and then he vomits up a slug into the sink. Big cliffhangers, yeah. right? Yeah. This ending for Stranger Things 2, a lot more subtle. It's okay. Eleven closed a rift, but like almost thinking along that Lovecraftian vibe, it's like, yeah, but now how much damage has been done to to Hawkins? Like, can that ever be just healed? You know, like do you know what I mean? Here's another thought. Have you Rev, have you played Half Life? Uh huh. Didn't didn't that doesn't this also remind you a lot of the Half Life story? Black Mesa opens up a portal, bad shit happens, and then <laughs> yeah, it's up to one guy to save the day. I mean, it, 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 you can go in so many different directions with this. The Duffer Brothers know what they're doing. Yeah. I'm assuming they know what they're doing. <laughs> well, I don't know if you watched Beyond Stranger Things. It's a Netflix series, and it's like it's a it's a um. 
Oh god, I can't remember his name. The bald guy who plays Dean Pelton on Community. Um, Jim Rash. Jim okay. Rash interviewing the cast, and they're like the episodes are like fifteen minutes long, and he interviews views the cast like three or four people at a time, right? And yeah. one of them he had the Duffer Brothers and one of the other producers whose name is escaping me at the moment, and they they were constantly talking about how they were rewriting as they were filming. Like, they were changing things. Like, originally, Bob Newby was supposed to die in episode four. Really? Yeah. And it was supposed to be Will that killed him. Originally, Will was supposed to be, like, evil. He was supposed to be, like, the, you know how he, he was, like, this shadow agent sort of character yes. towards the end? He was supposed to be that throughout the entire show. And it was supposed to be a much earlier reveal when he kills Bob Newby. But what happened was they fell in love with Shauna Aston. They're like, dude, Sean Aston is great. He's so good for the show. Oh, wait, I, I, I almost cried when Samwise Gamgee, who, who took the ring to Mordor, <laughs> died. They <laughs> almost like, didn't. They almost the didn't. Rings. <laughs> they almost didn't put him on because there's so many references to the '80s and so many callbacks to the '80s. They thought, dude, we can't have the kid from the Goonies be in our show. Uh, along with Lydia from Beetlejuice. <laughs> yeah. So it was a, it was almost such a go. And then the, they even made... So the, one of the other things I love about season two is more so than even season one, there are so many little, tiny, tiny hidden Easter eggs where they don't make it real obvious what they're doing. But if you catch the reference, it's amazing. Oh, yes. So when Sean Astin, a.k.a. Bob Newby, walks into uh, the the household and he sees the, the map that's just all over the place, um, uh -huh. after he figures out what it is, he goes, it's a map. What is there, pirate treasure at the end? I'm like, fucking Goonies. I know. That's I a said, Goonies said. reference. Because <laughs> he's in Goonies, and in Goonies, they, they find a map, and he's like, it's a, it's a, it's a map. And then what's at the end of the map is pirate treasure. <laughs> I, you know, but I, 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 and, 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 and to spoil some more stuff, but like I said, we, people are caught up. If they're not, I'm sorry. Paul Reiser's character. I, I, I hated him at first. I wanted to hate him. And then I fell in love with Paul Reiser's character. Dude, and how much did you expect Paul Reiser's character? I forget the name of the character, Doctor whatever. Let's just call him the Doctor. You mm -hmm. expected him to be a bad guy, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I was, I, yeah, I know that was the whole thing because he plays. I mean, I was thinking Aliens. All right, he was the douchebag in Aliens. <laughs> yes, and again because of the all the constant references to the eighties, you expect like, He's him to be a douchebag here, and he ended up being the hero at the end. Well, sort of hero, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Yeah, Beck says, that wasn't subtle. <laughs> well, I thought it was subtle. There's a lot of little subtle things like that. Like when Hop uh, is in the tunnels and he re he he's going to leave and he turns around over his shoulder and grabs his hat. Mm -hmm. It's, it's very Jones subtle, around. but it's the same way that Indiana Jones turns around and grabs his hat in, uh, uh, what is it, Raiders? No. Yeah, in Raiders. Yes. It's, it's like the exact same motion, the exact same cinematography. It's yep. like just that little tiny thing. Or um, like there are one or two lines. They're not delivered the same way, but they're word for word. And cadence wise, they're the same as like Ghostbusters movie. Like in Ghostbusters, yes. they, there's a couple lines that are shit. And I'm like, just those little things, you know? Uh, yeah, like at one point in time, they they were looking up at something. And he goes, "This doesn't look good," and I'm like, "Okay, that's that's Ghostbusters <laughs> or something like that." Does it someone way... say, "Don't get cocky" at one point, which yeah. is Star Wars reference? And there's so many of those little things that are in there, and they put it... them in there, but they don't feel forced because, of it... course, those kids love Ghostbusters, so of course they're gonna quote the movie, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yes, and that's another thing. I always, I, I, one thing I am big about when, when, when I watch period pieces like this is I always try to find the flaws. This is what I do, and I haven't found any real flaws yet. Like, 
what I mean by that is like like when they're making references to Empire Strikes Back, I literally was like, okay, what year is it? All right, so I'm looking it up. I'm like, okay, it was out by then. That's safe. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, the Duffer Brothers said that's even why the kids dress up as the Ghostbusters because that came out in um, 84, May. I believe. So the kids would have just recently have seen it. Like they would have, mm-hmm. that's the kind of movie those kids would love. They're, those four kids are science nerds. <laughs> so of course that's the movie they would go see and they'd love and they'd be like, I want to, dr- let's dress up as the Ghostbusters for Halloween. You know, it kind of makes perfect sense. The best, my best part was when, Duff, when, when they're, they arrive at school dressed as the Ghostbusters, they have the argument of who's going to be Winston and Dustin turns around and looks and then that that this that that cinematography shot was straight out of Ghostbusters. He goes, um, guys, <laughs> that was like, was like Ray said that, and he was sta- wasn't he Spans? Yeah, <laughs> no, he <Yep>. was Egon. <laughs> no, I think Will was Egon. I'd have to go back and look. I, I think Will was Egon, and uh, and Dustin was Stance. All right, I could be wrong, but it doesn't matter. I, I know what you're saying. It was but here's the other thing. Speaking of that scene where he turns around to look at the school bus, I watched the trailer for Stranger Things 2 probably about 20 times. And that part is in there where Dustin goes like, uh, guys. And (laughs) the way it was filmed, Will is behind Dustin and he's far enough back that he's not in the shot. Even though he's in that scene, you don't see him there. You just see yeah. Lucas off to one side and Mike off to the other, and it looks like they're looking up into the sky. And the using that part in the trailer, it's like, oh my god, what what are they looking at? Like, what kind of horrible monster is coming at them out of the air? And it but wasn't a horrible when, monster; it was school kids. And that's when the wind was blowing, and, and, and that was when Ray was looking up at the building, and he was, um, guys, I think we got to put a little overtime in on this one. But it was just that I. I I, I, I've seen the movie so many times that I know. Yeah. <laughs> it's like that's Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, dude. Okay, so also let's let's talk a little bit about some of the new characters they brought in. One of the criticisms that Stranger Things one had is you you see a lot of Will's family and Mike's family, and not Lucas or Dustin's. Right. Mm-hmm. So we got a chance to see. Lucas's mom and dad and adorable sister who just that character was perfect. Yes. I, I loved Lucas's younger sister. And you got to see Dustin's mom and oh my god, probably my favorite new minor character on that show. Dustin's mom? Yes. In the in the first episode when he's looking for quarters and he's like, Mom, can you get up? And she's like, eh. <laughs> and he goes right back at her. Eh! I'm like, oh my god! I know those two people. I I I have friends that to be like, yes. <laughs> like, come on, mom. And like, eh, eh. But speaking of the of Dustin, I went back and I started, like I said, watching season one and the evolution of Dustin from season one to season two is like night and day. Mm-hmm. And I like where they took the character. And I especially, and I, I know we talked about, I, I, mean, I said this in chat, but one time, I like the, I like the, the, uh, the chemistry between Steve and Dustin. That Absolutely. Is, that is poetry. The two of them together complement each other so well. <laughs> right, yeah. Because neither of them have brothers, and then all of a sudden they're this, like, hey, this is my older brother, Steve. This is my younger brother, Dustin. Like, it, it really worked. And it felt like it was very natural, too. Like, because yeah. they had this shared terror experience fighting the Demogorgon in season one. Yeah. So it would make sense that they trust each other. And Dustin needs help. No one's answering the radio. And then he finds Steve. And he's like, do you still have the bat? Let's go. You know. I, I know. I, I love that scene. He goes, your love life will have to wait. Get in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and then Steve just goes along with it like it's not <laughs> yeah I love that that was like beautiful <laughs> yeah and and again a lot of things that they put in there feel like references to 80s movies so I was talking to AJ and he goes dude Steve Steve's adventures in babysitting and yes 
you know, it, it made sense. It, it felt very natural. He, he fell into that role of, hey, someone's got to watch these kids or they're going to get into trouble. And of course they are. <laughs> and he steps up to the plate, you know. At, at no point can you ever hate any of these characters. Like even Billy, one of the other new characters that gets brought on, they even put in that scene with his father, you know, yeah, to make him just not this just total asshole. Like they, they almost give you this sense of where he's coming from. He's, it's, I, to me, he reminded me of uh, what's his face from The Lost Boys, Kiefer Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can yeah, see that. he was. To- that was totally a a callback to Kiefer Sutherland's character in Lost Boys, and I loved it. <laughs> well, I think he was going for the So, I think that Steve in the in season 1 started out with that sort of 1980s jock bully stereotype, but yeah. quickly it became apparent, no, he's not. He's not. You know, he st- it seems like he actually cares about Nancy mm-hmm. and a lot of the things he does like breaking Jonathan's camera, it's because he cares about he actually cares about Nancy and, you know, he feels regret over uh, his friend spray painting slut on the on the marquee, so that's why mm-hmm. he helps clean it. So and he, he buys Jonathan. He falls out of that stereotypical 1980s bully role pretty quick, whereas Billy comes in and Billy just ticks all of those 80s bully stereotypes yes. right away. Yes, but I, I mean, but Steve Harrington became my one of my favorite characters. I mean, I love Steve Harrington. I mean, I I, I mean. That one in the in season two in in the in, I think it was the last scene or one of the last scenes when they're trying to get every, he's trying to get all the kids out of the tunnel and like the dem, like the demodogs are coming after him. I was like, oh god, don't kill Steve, please don't kill Steve. <laughs> I said I will stop watching this show if you kill Steve. <laughs> well, um, Sean Astin knew when he got the role that that Bob Newby was going to die. Mm-hmm. And he just kept saying to the Duffer brothers, just please, the only thing, he goes, I'm fine. I don't care if my character dies. Just make my death heroic. Make my death heroic. Make my death. And he said it so many times that one of the Duffer was like, all right, we got it. We know what heroic means. We're on it. We got it. Calm down, Sean. <laughs> and uh, I, I feel like he absolutely did. You know, he died a hero. Although, classic 80s movie trope, dude, don't get away from the one monster and think you're safe and go, Woo, I'm safe. Everything's okay now. Because that's... Oh, I know. I, as soon as he did that, I'm like, oh, you're dead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I still can't believe... Uh, so Okay, so let's see. Some of the new characters. I, I want to kind of go over them all. So we mentioned Eight. And mm-hmm. there's definitely some mixed feelings about her. Uh, I know Lysane, and I've heard a lot of other people say the bottle episode with uh, where Eleven and Eight meet and had their little adventures, kind of was a lo- like definitely the lull in the series. I disagree. I think that was very integral to bringing the, the two sort of acts of the story together and, and integrating her back into the, the show for the, mm-hmm. for the sort of third act of the show. Um, we went over Bob Newby, played by Sean Astin, just awesome character. Oh, dude, real quick. And didn't you think that maybe Sean Astin, uh, Bob Newby, was a bad guy when he's giving Will that terrible advice in the car? He's like, just yes. tell him, go away. I was like, I, I, I see, I, that's another thing I, about the show that I like, is you don't know who's good and bad, mm-hmm. really, until the end. And, and, and you, the guy that played Dr. Brennan in the first season, you know who that is, right? Um, that was, uh, oh, oh uh, you mean Papa? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, Matthew Modine. Private Joker. Yeah, Matthew Moody. Full Metal Jacket. And I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I was like, I know that face. I know that face. And I looked him up. I was like, oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But no, but that's one thing I like about the show is you don't know who's good or bad right off the bat. So, like, I was I was predicting, you know, Paul Reiser was a bad guy. I thought, Sean, I mean, the way Sean Astin was acting, I was like, all right, he, he's up to no good. And Jonathan like, didn't like him either. So that you that was sort of a hint, like, oh, he must yeah. be bad. Bob must be bad. Um, really, I just want to address what Lysane saying. She goes, I knew it was coming, uh, and I get the point. I feel like they took too long of it. I'm afraid of change. And I also hated the big city. Uh, we're thugs. We're going to kill people kind of feel. 
again, I think that they were playing into the 1980s stereotype. Now, one of the things is all of those characters that were part of Eight's gang were all outcasts. They were all like, oh, no one wanted us. So I've seen that thousands of times in life. People feel like they are in a certain role, so they play up that stereotype. Like Axel with the mohawk. You know, people called him a punk, so he's like, fuck it, I'll embrace that, and I'll get the mohawk, and I'll get the leather jacket, and I'll be a jerk. You know? I, that He was one of my favorites from the gang, though, was was Axel. <laughs> uh, I felt like he was a little overdone. Like, they did it a lot more subtly with some of the other characters, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but I, I feel like... I, I, I get what Lysane's saying. I totally get what Lysane is saying. Um, okay, so we had, yeah, so we had, uh, so we had, I can't think of his name, Paul Reiser, the doctor yeah. for Paul Reiser, new character, fantastic. Um, yeah, I, th- I think a lot of people assumed he was going to be a bad guy, especially Spe- because of the way he goes, you what can what trust does- me, I'm not those guys, I'm, I'm a new guy, I'm not those no, guys. No, or when, or when he, when he had the kids in there, he goes, he goes, like these weeds, like the truth, I will burn it. To keep it, you know, contained it, no matter what the cost. And I was like, oh, oh, was that a threat? <laughs> the only reason I don't agree with you there, I mean, yeah, that was absolutely a threat. I, I think it was absolutely a threat. But the only thing I don't agree with you is, um, well, actually, you know what? Let me say this. When was the point when you realized he's not the bad guy? When was the point when you realized he's not the bad guy? Um, when they get locked down. See, it happened just before that for me. Um, they have Will oh, in the no. medical bag. Oh, no, you're right. When he goes, tell me that, t- tell me that yeah, again. Say he that to me again. Yeah, when the guy's t- like, hey, we may have to let Will die. And he turns and he looks at the other doctor and he's like, say that to me again. It's like, dude, all right, this guy really is a good guy. He cares. He's trying to do the best he can. Yeah, I, I will say that. When he said that, I was like, okay, he's not the bad guy. And then Sean Astin was there, and I was like, okay, he's the bad guy. <laughs> yeah, so Sammy actually feels almost the opposite of Lysane. She, While well, Lysane said it felt like it took too long, uh, uh, Sammy is saying she feels like that bottle episode. The bottle episode seems really divisive. Uh, a lot of people either loved it, like I did, or, or hated it, or there's a lot of feelings on it. But Sammy says... It feels like they blasted through the whole thing too quickly, which I get. I get, but at the same time, when you've only got nine 45 minute long episodes mm-hmm. to tell this whole story, it can be pretty tough. That's not a lot of time. And, you know, people are very critical of shows like this, too. And I, I, I don't understand why. I mean, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the 1960s show, The Prisoner. Sorry, I'm not. All right, lost. Okay. J.J. Abrams was originally told he had one season to tell his story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, and, and, and when you're making stuff like this, there's no – the first season is never a guarantee you're going to get a second season. So a lot of times they try to tell the entire story as fast as they can in one season and hope for the best. Yeah. You know what I mean? And to me, as much as I love the first season, it did seem like a lot of it was all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I understand why. I mean, I, you know, I make, I make movies and stuff. So I understand when you have certain things you got to do in a certain amount of time, you got to do as much as you can. And what, what I was, once I think they realized they were onto something, is when they started really digging into the story a little deeper. And that's how we got eight. And, you know, I'm not saying it was rushed or anything. I think they had an idea of what they wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But I don't think they were thinking they were going to get as big as they did. As fast as they did. I almost have the feeling that they may not have known the kind of reception that Stranger Things 2 was going to get. Mm-hmm. You know? Like, the first one was very well received, obviously. They were renewed for a second season. But I don't think it was until after... Um, I'd have to look. I, I'd have to double check. I don't want to say this and get it wrong. I'm just going to say it. I might be wrong. I don't think it was until after season two came out that they were picked up for more seasons. Yes. But 
uh, I think Netflix uses metrics to see, well, the trailer for season two has been watched 950,000 times in the last three days. So <laughs> we probably got something. <laughs> no, but I mean, I don't think they would have killed off Dr. Brennan had they known they were going to get renewed. Well, let's be honest. Do we know and, that he's dead? Well, that's the thing, and that that, that dude that that that, that bottle episode. Because that's what that's what brought all this up. As I was thinking of the bottle episode, was that he said, "Doctor Brennan's not dead. I know where he is." Yeah, and I was like, "Was that last minute? Did they did they kind of?" I, and then, see, I started I started taking things apart. I was like, "Did they not know they were going to get renewed?" Obviously, it didn't. So therefore, they. They, you know, but it's it's like it, it's like it's like comic book logic. Anyone could die and come back. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know. So I, I I don't know. I'd like to see. I mean, when he said that, and then they never really touched base on that again. I'm what I mean. That's something that's always been in the back of my head all season two. Is where's Doctor Brennan if he's not dead? Yeah. Well, because we don't see him die. We see the Demogorgon leap on him and tackle him to the ground, and that's all we see. Right. I'd have to go back and rewatch. It's it's one of the last episodes of season one, and the other the other thing I like, and I, I always like this when they touch on that, is the MK Ultra project. You know what that is? Yep. Okay, I love when when people hit on that because that really happened. Mm -hmm. We really did that. <laughs> so there's always that sense of is this really going on somewhere? You know, not, not that I think the government's tearing holes to another dimension, but. You know, who's to say they're not trying? <laughs> well, so interesting story. Originally, the show was not going to be called Stranger Things. It was going to be called Montauk Point. Now, Montauk Point is like an upstate New York or possibly New Jersey. I can't remember. Like tiny little vacation resort town. Yes. And Montauk right. Point had one of these Manhattan Project type government conspiracy cover up type things where the government was doing some weird stuff and there was some sort of accident and the government covered it all up and people were like, oh, they were experimenting with time travel or something. You know, like there's all sorts of weird conspiracy theories. And really what everyone kind of believes it, it had something to do with the Manhattan Project. You know, <laughs> I, I don't know. But, but, I, but they realized that it would be better... To pull it out of New York and put it sort of in the Midwest, throw it in a fictional town in Indiana. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know. I, I think Hawkins works. You know, I yeah, think but, but, that, but that, then I'm always I mean, but that I mean the the first the first few episodes I literally was like, this is Half Life the show. They took Half Life the video game and made a show out of it. <laughs> and then and then I started watching more of it and I was like, this is really good. And then. I was also brought. A lot of it reminded me of Super Eight. Mm -hmm. That was the first cool. scene. I, I mean, a handful of kids on their bikes trying to save the world from this alien onslaught. <laughs> Speaking of which, you know the bike chase scene in, in uh, the first series. Yes, that was almost not in there. They were deliberately trying to avoid a bike chase scene because of the comparison to ET. But then eventually they just realized, like, we've got to put it in. It's the only thing that makes sense, you know. And so they put it in. And then that... So another thing is that uh, when Eleven flips the van, practical mm -hmm. effect. They tried to use a lot of practical effects in the first season. They tried not to use much CG. Like, the Demogorgon was a dude in a suit. That wasn't CG, you know. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, the, the van getting flipped practical effect and it cost them a lot of money you know and obviously they composited it the kids weren't actually riding underneath as it happened but that was a real effect but, that they composited see, it I, in again that, that goes back to the whole 80s feel mm -hmm. and that's when when jj when jj abrams got the job to do the next star wars movies they were like more cgi more cgi and he goes no why don't we go back to what makes star wars great in the first place and do nothing but practical effect well not nothing but practical right. effect do as much practical effects as we can because that's why and, and it works yeah. <laughs> as it does in stranger things yeah it was 
I mean, it's, it really is a masterpiece of a show. It's just amazing. Um, yeah. We're getting into the last 10 minutes, though, and I feel like I've dominated the conversation. I want to know what you wanted to talk about with it. Like, was there something that we haven't hit that you specifically were like, oh, dude, did you notice how blah, 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 blah. Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I literally binge watched it in a week, seasons one and two. I, I, I didn't, I was turned off by it because everyone, I, I mean, I hate to sound like the eternal hipster. It's like everyone was talking about it. So I was like, enough already. Because people did that with me with The Walking Dead. And I, I tried watching The Walking Dead. No, no offense to you Walking Dead fans out there, but I'm tired of zombies. I really am. <laughs> So and then and then Game of Thrones. It's like everyone was telling me I need to watch Game of Thrones. I need to watch Game of Thrones. I tried watching it and I and I wasn't impressed. Um, same thing happened years ago with The Ring when The Ring first came out. It's like the scariest movie ever, and everyone hyped it up. I watched it and I was like, where was the scary parts? So I, when people do that, it's like I tend to be like, all right, I, I don't want to see it if it's this, you know. So. I sat down, I watched one episode, and I found myself, I gotta watch another one. <laughs> you know? and, and, and next thing you know, I was, I've been, you know, within, within a week, I ended up watching seasons one and two. And I, 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 I think one thing that, that a lot of people aren't touching on is what is in the upside down? I want to know. It can't be nothing but just a barren wasteland. If it is a parallel dimension or another world or the opposite of our world, there has to be people or or the demogorgons, the you know the the equivalent of what people are in this world. Mm-hmm. Some so I've heard some fan theories say that Will is the monster. I've heard some people say that that Levin's the monster. I've also heard. You know, you know what I like to see. I want to see what I want to see come out of the show is I want to see more exploration of the Upside Down. Hmm. Did you know also the Upside Down almost wasn't even in the first season? They were going. They constantly referred to it as the Shadow Plane after the D and D reference, and they wanted to leave it very mysterious and just that you had to just use your imagination. But they eventually realized that they had to shoot some scenes there. And that it was very heavily inspired. The look of it was inspired by Silent Hill. Did you ever play Silent Hill? Yes. Very foggy, white wisps of stuff floating through the air. Do, yeah. you, know where Silent, do you know where Silent Hill was based off of? Mm, no. A small town in Pennsylvania called Centralia where the coal is burning underneath. And it always sends coal ash into the air. <laughs> yes, still burning. It's been burning for like, what, 80 years or something? It's 1968. Oh, 68, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's been yeah, it's and it's still going. Central uh yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, yep. If you ever if, for those of you watching, just just Google Centralia, Pennsylvania, you will see what we're talking about. <laughs> but no, I want to see more shots of the upside down. I want to know the 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 the, the life that inhabits that realm to see I want to know how seven or how eleven rather was able to open up how how all right. This is the part that has, has baffled me. You know, they put her in the sensory deprivation thing. They send her into like this, this like. They're calling it the void. void, the space between the two worlds. They're calling it the yeah. void. How was that creature there? Well, I don't That's think. Funny. I don't think the Demogorgon was there. I think that that Eleven can send her consciousness into the void between the two worlds, okay? Mm-hmm. But she, and she can inter, she can see and talk to and sense objects and people that are in either of the two worlds, but she can't interact with them. And you've seen that several times. In in season 2, she tries to touch Mike and Mike vanishes into a puff of smoke. In season 1, she finds Will Byers inside Fort Byers. She touches him and he and the fort vanish into a puff of smoke because they're not actually there. They're not actually in the void. She's sensing people in one world or the other, and the void is is the thin barrier between those two worlds. But how did she open up that thin barrier? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, my feeling is that that barrier is almost not there 
in Hawking's for whatever reason, you know, cosmic forces or just random strange fate, but Eleven was able to puncture the barrier. Okay, that's my that's my feeling on it. And now, after the events of season one and two, that barrier is very weak. Even with the way that season two ended, with her closing yeah. that barrier back down, I think that that's what the, is going to be the basis for future episodes. Is now well because we've seen in season one that the barrier can be opened not just at the lab right you know when nancy goes through the tree mm -hmm. and i was like okay so there's more than one portal there's more than one rift all right so our rift's gonna start i mean even will found a rift in his own house mm -hmm. granted he couldn't punch through it but it was there right and how could the demogorgon get through it and close it down but you need to be, you, need, you know what I mean? There's well, a lot I think, of questions. I think the holes naturally close because you see the vines kind of sealing those rifts eventually anyways. Mm -hmm. Be it the tree or the wall in the buyer's home or what have you, they tend to try to close. The exception being the rift that Eleven opened in the lab. And then in season two, the rift that the mind flare is opening underneath the lab. Yeah. But they, they really, they really need to. I, I think the. I think they know what they're doing. Like I said, I think they already have a plan. I'm sure they do. But I want to see what I want. I mean, I want to see more of that. I, I want to see more of, of Dustin and Steve. That has to be a thing. Steve, uh, Steve, better come back. <laughs> I, I mean, you. And I kind of knew that they were going to kill off Bob. I hate to say it, but I kind of knew because they were always hitting towards Hopper and. Uh, Joyce, you know, having a thing, and apparently they did at one point in time. <laughs> um, it. I don't think. I don't know. It's not exactly clear what their history is, but yeah, that's the the fan sites are all like, uh, hashtag Jop, Joyce Hop. <laughs> They're like ship it, ship it. <laughs> I yeah, think I mean, it's 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 a no brainer, right? Yeah. And when Hopper, Hopper is another one of my favorite characters. When he was in the tunnels and and then the vines started to close in on him and wrap around him, I was like, I literally, I I, I was sad. I, I almost started to cry a little bit. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> I was like, please don't kill Hopper, please. <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't want this to be. I don't want this to be a Game of Thrones thing where you know one of your favorite characters could die at any point in time. I don't I, that's another thing I don't like. I, I mean, I, I, I you, you, you've evolved with the characters. You want to, you want to keep them alive. <laughs> but you know what? You feel like that can happen. Any of those characters might. Oh, I know. Be, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring up one last thing, and then we, we're gonna have to wrap up. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Right. Um, where do the, where do we go with Will Byers? Now, in season one, you almost never saw him. You just. Yeah. He wasn't present, unfortunately. For, for all intents and purposes, season two, you were really introduced as... He was like a new character. Yeah, he almost <laughs> was. And then season two, he's this double agent of sorts. So yes. where do we go? I mean, God, don't you just want season three to him just be a normal kid almost and not have to, like, be the missing or bad guy kid? I don't know. I don't think they're going to do that. I think they're going to. I think he's going to be like the vessel between two worlds now. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a constant thing, and it's it's it's. I eventually think he's going to embrace it and become like the avatar kind of thing, but I don't. I don't know. I, I, I and, and I want. I want to see. If anything, I want who I want to see have a normal life. It's eleven. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean.